Um, I'm delighted to have two very eminent and interesting speakers to offer to you today. We're going to have half an hour each, which will include their presentation, plus a chance for questions from those of you in the room and also from those online, and welcome everyone online too. Um, we're going to start off with Jo Axe, who's Associate Dean at Royal Road. She's going to be talking about the subject so many of us are interested in now, which is OERs. Um, she tells me she's from the UK originally and went to Canada in the 80s. Um, and she's been a businesswoman as well as an academic. So I think all learning technologies will particularly benefit from uh, your both pragmatic and, and conceptual approach. So I'm sure you'd rather hear from her rather than me. Um, so over to you, Jo, and off we go. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. So as was mentioned, I'm the Associate Dean in the Faculty of Management at Royal Roads University. Uh, Royal Roads is in Victoria in British Columbia. I don't know how many of you have been to British Columbia, but it's not too different, the climate where I, I live myself from what it is here. What I'm going to do today is I'm talking about, there are two main elements. One is the bridging program that we are doing at Royal Roads, which bridges students coming into our BCom program. The other component is the open educational resource. So we took the bridging program and we put it open, uh, which was done through a grant from BC Campus, which allowed us to have some resources to do that process. So what I'm going to talk about firstly is, to put it into context, is the post-secondary education in British Columbia. Now, where I am, came from, it's now 20 to 4 in the morning. So I had asked a couple of my colleagues to join me online so we could have a live interaction. Unfortunately, they were asleep, so they said they preferred giving a video presentation. So I have two very short video clips just to put things into context. One is from our Dean, Pedro Marquez, who is an international himself, he's from Mexico, has a very interesting perspective and is going to just discuss post-secondary education in British Columbia to put it into the context. The second person is Mary Burgess, who is our director for CTET, which are, is our Centre for Educational Technologies, Learning and Technologies. So we'll have a couple of clips. I'm going to talk briefly about BC Campus. They gave us uh, part of the grant that allowed us to complete this process. I'll put it into the context going smaller as in Royal Roads University and what our students look like. I am completely uh, not familiar with teaching in lecture halls. We have maximum class sizes of around 55 students. So we usually teach in a uh, group and we use dialogue, walk around the class, discuss things. It's so a little bit different from the lecturing that I, I've done actually once in another venue. So a little bit different for me. So first of all, we'll be talking about the uh, opening the bridge and how the process we took to get to having it available for use. What I wanted to do first was, is everybody familiar with Canada? It's a big country. So I just wanted to put it into context because not everybody realizes that, my mother included, I was born in Doncaster and uh, she still thinks I live in Vancouver, which is actually not the same as Vancouver Island. So I just wanted to put it into a slightly context here, so you can actually see where I'm talking about. Vancouver Island is about the size of Wales. So the population of the island is, I think, around 400,000 people. It's not very big. Most of them live in uh, the Victoria area. So the place that I work is Colwood. And we have one of the only universities that has a castle on campus. So the university here is, whoops, lost it. It's right here. So it's on uh, Aboriginal land. It's on Coast Salish land, which is many of the communities in, the U in Canada are established on the territories of the First Nations peoples. Ours is on Coast Salish. So I just wanted to acknowledge that before I continue with the, the slide presentation. So first I'd like you to hear from Dean De Pedro Marquez, who's going to just ch chat a little bit about the context of, of post-secondary education. Hello, how do you do? My name is Pedro Marquez, and I'm delighted to join you today. I've been invited by uh, Dr. Joe Axe, uh, Associate Dean at the Faculty of Management at Royal Roads University, to say a few words and share a few ideas with you about uh, British Columbia's post-secondary education system, and it is, my, it is my pleasure. 
I, I, I quickly would like to like to share with you that I actually I attended university in Mexico, came to Canada for my master's and my PhD, and then went back to teach for a very large prestigious Mexican university. And now I've been with Royal Roads University as dean for the last four years. So at these, I've had an opportunity to experience both the Canadian and Mexican uh, systems as a student and as uh, administrator and professor, which I think it gives me uh, a little bit of a general perspective and opportunity to make a few comments from, from the Mexican comparison. So it's, it is my pleasure to share these, some of the ideas with you. Uh, the Br British Columbia system is part of the larger Canadian system. The, the one in the province of British Columbia on the, on the west coast of Canada is integrated composed by 25 different institutions. They run between 1,900 and 2,000 different programs in many, many different levels. Out of these 25 institutions, 11 are universities, all public funded, 11 are colleges, all public funded, and there are three institutes with very specific mandates and, 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 and object, objectives. There is, uh, parallel to this public fund, publicly funded uh, system, a, a system of uh, private colleges and universities offering programs as well to different needs of society, but really, the strength, the forte of, of British Columbia's higher education system lies in the public education system. Um, colleges, they offer programs, short-term programs in the trades and, and uh, diplomas ranging from, from very uh, technical skills into more professional disciplines. They, I believe that they're doing a very good job and they complement what uh, private colleges are actually doing mostly in the sense of attracting international students are supporting their advance through the, through the Canadian economy in in sense of advancing the language and social so language skills and social adjustment processes the the 11 universities are are very strong and this is my honest absolute opinion uh, ranging from very specialized institutions like nor like uh, uh, Royal Roads University, who has been created with a special purpose of serving the working professional, to the University of British Columbia, which I'm con convinced that is one of the top uh, best universities around the world. These universities offer from a diploma, uh, undergraduate degrees, to master's and doctoral programs in, in many different disciplines. So you, you would find a very wide spectrum and, uh, and portfolio of different programs for you to take uh, uh, within the BC system. Um, I believe that there are some tremendous features that make this system uh, very positive, very strong, and there are some other challenges that they will have to deal in, in the years to come. Among the features that I believe are important uh, high, highlighting are, are the fact that the system is pretty well balanced in terms of disciplines, approaches, uh, lenses. It is pretty well balanced in the, in the sense of their geographical scope and, and reach. Although most of the universities are located within the Greater Victoria and Greater Vancouver areas, uh, the, the college system do does spread out throughout throughout the whole system. I think that they do uh, they do have a very great uh, strength in in graduating with individuals not only with great professional uh, skills but also capacity to add value and become valuable members of society, responsibility, civility, citizenship. Uh, the system has also done a very good job in, uh, in reacting to the multicultural needs of the multicultural Canadian um, uh, population, although the, these universities have not yet uh, accomplished a significant amount of cooperation in order to do a better job in attracting and retaining top talent uh, uh, from across the world uh, 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 through their university. Uh, programs. Um, as well, I believe that the programs are very interdisciplinary, which, which is nothing but good news for, for the overall composition of the BC system. In terms of challenges for, for the future, I think that there are a couple, uh, but probably the most important is the end of the BC, of the, of the uh, baby boom. Uh, society in Canada, as in the rest of the world, is changing, and now that constant flow of students that demanding traditional programs is, is coming to an end, and so universities will, will have to respond to the, to the demanded uh, need for evolve, to evolve from a training into a knowledge management institution. So the portfolio and, and, and pedagogical approaches will probably have to adjust. The system will face uh, some financial stresses as well. The, the common denominator has been a, a particular financial model, which is the one that has been used by, by most institutions in, in North America. That will be under, under pressure in the years to come simply because of, of the general financial situation uh, that North American institutions and governments are facing uh, around the world, not only in North America. And uh, I, I also believe that there is a need 
for uh, a more collaboration and, and support in, in an integrated strategy for how to attract and retain international students so that they actually go back to their countries of origin and, and add value and expand the prestige and reputation of the Canadian firms, or, or maybe to stay in, in Canada, particularly British Columbia, and enrich the changing needs of the Canadian, Canadian society. So overall, I believe that the balance is very rich. This is a great place to come and learn and study, and institution, the institutions of this place are, are ready to, for receiving you. So uh, I hope that this quick, very quick uh, review and description of the BC higher education system is useful towards your discussions. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure meeting you. Good luck. Just so you know, I told Pedro he had two minutes. Um, and this is, I should have known better because Pedro does not talk in two-minute slots. So that, that gives you a little bit of an overview of what British Columbia educational system is. It's not a lot different from the challenges that you're facing here. So that the financial constraints are also challenging us. Our own university is slightly different because our mandate is a little bit different from other universities. And we are not as highly funded by the government. Uh, we still get some funding, but not as many. The grant that we received was from BC Campus, which contributed a small amount to the project that we were doing. And that what they try to do is connect all the institutions in BC. So you've got the 25 that Pedro was talking about. Um, they have several things that we, we take part in that will allow us to share our resources and students have access to uh, different types of degree completion plans. So Royal Uni Roads University itself, the way we usually teach is teams and cohorts. So the cohorts move through the program together. They are set on teams, usually five, six people on a team. Up to 30% in the faculty management is based on teamwork of their assessed val uh, grade, final grade. So it's really important that they work together. When we have students from different backgrounds, different ethnic groups, we have challenges in the classroom. So one of the reasons for developing the bridge was because of the challenges that we were faced with. Uh, the blended learning is the model that we use. There are many different versions of blended learning, I understand that. The model that we particularly use is for our online students, they come in for a residency at the beginning. They take a block of, of courses online, and then they have another residency at the end. So they have an opportunity to work on the teams in the face-to-face -face environment before they leave to go online. Uh, the learning community is a big piece. We spend time at the beginning of all the programs that in the faculty management helping students understand what it means to be part of a learning community, how they can contribute, what they can expect. And we primarily focus on graduate students and students in their third and fourth years. So we don't get a lot of students straight out of high school. And mainly the students in the faculty of management itself are people who have at least three years work experience for the undergrad programs and seven years work experience for the graduate programs. So you can tell that the type of environment they're in, they have a lot of skills, background, knowledge to bring into the classroom. So that all affects what they're doing. Now the bridge itself, we call it the bridge to be calm. It's an opportunity for students to get together online, to learn a little bit about each other, to start building that learning community. And the idea behind it was to break down some of the problems, such as the one that this student quoted at the beginning. So when we started the project, which was in 2005, we interviewed a few students. One of the ones said they could not wait to get back to their place, their safe haven, after the classroom because they didn't feel safe in the classroom. So we didn't want them to have that feeling that they were uh, marginalized in the classroom. We wanted to give them a, a, an opportunity to discuss things before students came on campus so that they were a bit more of an even playing field. And a staff member again had a similar comment from the BCom student. She said that they came, what they tell her is I came for BCom. I didn't come for an international experience. That's not why I'm here. So what we wanted to do is try and emphasize to those students the value of having that international experience in the classroom. And even though they were domestic Canadian students, that coming into a classroom that had students from India, China, uh, Korea, all over the world, was beneficial and that they could learn a lot and share a lot with those students. So what we did was we, invent, we invented, we created something that I, I know has been used in other places. And I know there's one, I think, called Stepping Stones in the UK that was used. And we incorporated some of the ideas and built on that. So what we had was a number of activities that the students take part in. They have an, a general orientation to the school, the university, and their program. So that's just information download to them. Uh, then they have a get acquainted 
site. So they go on and they post a couple of things, we ask them questions, and then they, they start a discussion. And what we wanted them to do was to try to uh, get in an environment where it's not just about them, it's about finding out about what's going on in other people's lives. There's proactive hosted discussions, so we had uh, several places where the students could go in and learn about things that they were going to be doing with somebody who'd already been there. So University Life would come on and tell them about disability programs, so in case they needed to know things about that. We would have uh, students, who, alumni who'd come back in, who'd taken part in competitions, our case competition, and they would tell them how to do that. Students for Free Enterprise, there was another group came in and did something for that. So there are lots of things that they could ask about. There was a welcoming Q&A, again, just a discussion area, and then we did something called Dinner and a Movie. So what we did was we gave them, uh, a movie, you have, to show, you have to read this movie, watch this movie at some point during the week, here's a recipe, and watch, that, watch the movie, eat the food, and then we'll talk about it. So it was actually quite an interesting uh, exercise. Presentation skills, we had a brief discussion on that. Course, course preparation, which they didn't have to do, uh, but it was there if they wanted to, so they could do the readings ahead. Then this key piece on learning community, individual reflection on learning community, they had some reading to do, and then a discussion, and they had to have a short bio biography about, uh, sorry, a short exercise that they had to write about what they thought learning community meant to them. We took that into the foundations, which is number 11, and provided them with the opportunity to discuss it further and to develop a learning community themselves. So this all started online. They didn't know each other, uh, and there was a great opportunity for dropping into other people's posts and chatting that way. So what they said about it, they wanted to create connections. Uh, so they, they came in there wanting to do something, it gave them that familiarity so that when they walked in the classroom they knew people on the first day and it started them thinking about learning community. So what did it mean to be part of an ROU classroom? What did it mean to come to the university and be in a learning community? It was a small step, lots of additional things that they could do. It gave them confidence and without it they would have been scared. Those were the good things. There were also some things they didn't like. So <laughs> one student said nobody was posting on it, no interaction, too much pressure. So we were saying, you have to do this, it's mandatory. They didn't like it, pushed back. They went into panic mode because it was one of those things where for an introvert, didn't really want to do that yet. They weren't mentally ready for it, wasn't prepared for it. So it created stress, didn't have enough time because I was working. And when they've got similar backgrounds, so this individual noticed that students who had similar things going on, they actually focused on students who are like themselves rather than what we wanted or hoped they would do is try and find things out about students that they didn't know about. Um, I'm going to skip over that because I see the time is budging on and I will go over some of the points that Mary pointed out. That actually is one of the most recent pictures of Mary that I could find, which is when she was the age of seven. So what we did was we took this course and it's one of many of the resources that we've got at Royal Roads that are actually posted for everybody to share. We wanted to share it, but not just sort of drop it out there and let everybody figure it out for themselves. So what we tried to do was make sure we had all the information so it was a collaborative effort across the units. We offered technical advice, comments, and rationale. So we looked at what people were doing and why they were doing it. And we actually had good inter exchange between faculty and uh, the, the Center for Teaching and Educational Technologies. It was the highly customizable items. So there were some of those things that ha had to be noted so that we could make sure that people understood why they were there. And then we embedded some pedagogy in it, so there are notes throughout this uh, OER. So with the OER, we first had to obtain permission, because not everybody wanted to take part in this. Some faculty members said, don't want my, my stuff up there. Please leave me out of it. We obtained course, uh, so copy the course, so it's a template, and then you prepare the course. So with quality control, uh, there are several check boxes that we all have, as I'm sure everybody else would have with their quality control. There were privacy and copyright issues. As you probably can understand, there are a lot of things that you can't post online if it's got student information in. So we had to remove that, those things out. We had to look at what, what we had put and where we put it and make sure that it was accessible. And then there are Creative Commons and attributing share alike licenses, which I think you also have the same types of issues, challenges. And then the last piece, when we'd done all those things, was to add that pedagogy piece so that we could let people understand why we were doing what we were doing. So as a conclusion, the reflections that we had on this whole process of uh, putting a course into an OER 
it's best to start small. So start with things that you're really familiar with. We had uh, several courses that were doing many, well, some were more complex than others. The one that was started, the first one out, was actually the one that the Center for Teaching and Educational Technologies did themselves. It's their uh, how to, it's an instructional skills workshop. So it allowed people to go in and understand what it was like to teach online. And that's apparently one of the most popular downloads. So they find that a lot of people like that one and will take it and customize it for their own use. Have clear guidelines. That was actually, in, in answer to a question I asked of Mary, what happens if you find somebody wants to put their course on, but you're not sure if it's a course it should be on? Uh, so Mary said what we do is we have really clear guidelines so people understand what it is we're looking for in a course and what we would like to put forward because not every course is appropriate. Uh, and it does take time. So the sharing across units, the conversations you have to have, it's not uh, a small piece. She said it, once they've got all the checkoffs and everybody's okay with doing it, it takes them about two days to go through the, the process of uh, getting the course ready for opening. And make sure you've got sufficient resources, which is something we all struggle with. Our, our own thing is continuous improvement, so we're continually trying to figure out what it is we need to do and how we need to change it, so each time there's another reiteration, we find out more things that we could be doing to making it better. And understanding that some people will opt out. So even though somebody has this fantastic course with lots of tools embedded in it, and you know that students love it, that individual might choose to say, I don't want it. So we have to be okay with that. And one of the other critical pieces Mary mentioned in her uh, video clip was that it's important to get buy-in from senior management to do this. Our university is very small. We have less than 2,000 FTs, so student numbers are small. Our university is one way you can walk across campus in about five minutes. Uh, we have a castle on it, so it's, it's very small. Uh, so it's easy for us to get buy-in. We talk to people on a daily basis. It might be different in other institutions. And that is it. I believe that's a 20 minutes. So. <laughs> oh, five, a couple minutes, yeah. Um, that's what well, two o'clock. Thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> the two clocks are saying different times. I've been going by this one. So um, thank you very much. Thank you, Joe, for sharing an insight into uh, what sounds like a most interesting place and, uh, uh, and uh, to explain some of the things that you're really addressing, which I know are at the heart of much of what everyone is tackling. Um, so, colleagues, if you can put your hand up if you have a question, and we'll get the mic to you. But I think we'll go over to any online questions yet. Um, well, just just a minute. If we can just ask you to wait for the mic, because we're um, recording. So there's one here. Um. It's only a very short question, uh, Joe. It's Vicky McGarvey from Nottingham Trent University. What's the name of the OER resource that you've created and how will we find it? Okay, so if you go, if you type in World Water University OER, you'll, it'll pop just up. It's just embedded Google. in it. Yeah. And this one's called the Bridge to Becom. I think they just call it the Bridge, but it's the Bridge to Becom. And is it going to be deposited in any repositories or, and how do you? You, you just access it straight yeah, from there. Yeah. And if anyone has any questions whatsoever, Mary Burgess, and I have some business cards yeah. if you're interested. I mean, it might be useful if you put it in some repositories because then you'll get a few she, more bits. They may have done that already. Yeah, I'm, I'm the yeah. faculty side of it and she's the technical yeah, side of it, so yeah. Mary probably has done all kinds of things with it that I'm not aware of, but I'll definitely mention that to her. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Yeah. Can we click on that? If question? you click on it, you should come up, yeah. Should we have a look at it? Sure. We'll see if we can get it. Any more yeah. questions? Just up there. So we're just pulling uh, it up. Hello there, uh, Clive Young from uh, UCL. Hey, I'm just w wondering what was the motivations for the academic staff who were uh, involved in producing that? Uh, and did that change over time? So for the particular course or for the... Uh, both for the, uh, for the particular course and really, uh, can I guess, for kind of long-term plans for OER as well? Right. It's, it's just an idea of changing yep. perceptions. Really. For sure. So from the... Actually, it was mine. <laughs> so I was the academic that was... Uh, primarily wanting to get involved in this project um, because the, the because of the challenges we're finding in the classroom. When I was teaching with the BCom program, there were a lot of team conflicts and, and problems with students not wanting to work together and students feeling marginalized. So 
if you're in a classroom and you've got those challenges, it's layered on top of all the instructional material you're trying to give to them, especially when you teach with a high uh, element of team in your assessment, so we, up to 30%, as I said. So in order to try to minimize the after effects of it, we were trying to put something in at the beginning. So the motivation came from me wanting to try and instill something at the beginning that would allow them not to have to go through the amount of time invested when I was actually trying to teach content. So it, it, so it's from that perspective. From um, it, it kind of grew from there, though. That was, well, as I said, I think it was 2005, 2006. And every year, somebody else has got on board and done different things. So it's now mainly run by the administration in the BCom office. They make sure that it's up and running and everybody's got incentives to keep going, so. Yeah. Okay, that's very interesting. I, I'm sure all of us are interested in sustainability. Yeah. Um, Dominic uh, has asked a question um, coming in from online and would like to know some of the reasons why people, I assume he means faculty and academic staff, uh, gave for opting out of the OER process. I think the biggest opt-out was just from that fact that people are looking at what you've got and that criti critical element of not wanting to put yourself out there. So I don't know that we've had that many opt-outs. It's primarily, uh, as far as I know, I only know of, I believe, one that was not confident about wanting to put themselves out. So it doesn't mean that it reflected on their particular piece uh, of the course or anything. It's just that their, their preference was to keep it to them tight till they were ready I guess to do it so hopefully we can work on that and get them more confident with it. It, it was a secondary from Dominic online but he was actually saying is there a case for requiring CC licensing? Mm. So <laughs> sorry CC licensing that's yeah. what is that? A creative Commons. Creative Commons okay sorry I, there's so many acronyms. Um, that's a question for me. I'm not sure if I'm qualified to, uh, to ask that. I don't well, know. We'd like to have a go at it. I'll have a go at it. Okay. I, I, my own personal feeling is I think people need to be ready to put their things out. Um, and if they're not, I'm not sure that we should be mandating it. But that's my, my personal piece. I, I think that people may have a reason for it, may, may choose later to put it out, and that's what I think is happening in, in this particular case. So I, I'm not sure that I mandate of commons. So. <laughs> okay, well, before we get into a debate on yes. that, I'll bring this to a close. So, uh, thank you very much, Joe. It was thank really you. interesting insights. And can we thank Joe by waving our Creative Commons <laughs> license? <laughs> thank you very much.